And the Lord showed me something about a very, very destructive mindset, a destructive attitude, a destructive desire that most men and women, families alike, embrace even till this day. And God is going to expose it today. And that word is pride. Pride will destroy many. When I looked at the scriptures, I found out something very quickly. <laughs> we used to talk about people or say things and be like, oh, you hurt my pride. <laughs> you hurt my pride. Well, I'm going to tell you something. God is going to kill your pride. He's out to kill it before it kills you. I'm going to repeat that. He's out to kill it before it kills you. You want God to kill your pride. You want to walk in humility. You don't want to operate in any shred of defiance or rebelliousness. Because I'm going to tell you right now, God is setting something into motion. He's already set into motion. And we're going to see what the scriptures tell us. There's something that God wants to do in this place. And um, he has to establish righteousness. Um, I thought about well, the first time, I think when I turned 18. And usually people think about, you know, all the bad stuff they can do. When they turn 18 or they turn 21, but specifically 18. And I thought about <clears throat> how I thought I was really grown up, you know? I was 18, I'm grown, don't tell me nothing, right? And one of the weirdest things that I thought, I mean, it was weird to me, but I was like, hey, I can vote now. Awesome, let's go. And um, I think it was around, I don't know, whatever, whatever time. I don't know if it was around the Gore Bush or whatever, but I know some of my friends were. And I was just like, I don't want to vote for any crony. <laughs> so, but it's like, that's the thing that we, we, we take pride in that. I know it's like an American thing, you know. Um, other countries do the same thing. They elect their leaders and things like that. You know, they operate from a democracy. Um, but you guys heard me say this before. But in the kingdom of God, there's no democracy. It's a theocracy. It's a place where God and his kingdom, everything is about the king. Amen? It's the thoughts and intentions of the king. Nothing else, nothing more. And so God wants to make sure that in his kingdom, everything that he desires goes forward. And whoever he elects, whoever he appoints, Whatever he establishes is completely his authority. And as human beings, we often mess that thing up because we think we know better than God. And God is trying to get us to a place now of complete obedience to his ways and to his will. And so I was reading these scriptures and the Lord showed me something. We used to talk about people or say things and be like, oh, you hurt my pride. You hurt my pride. Well, I'm going to tell you something. God is going to kill your pride. He's out to kill it before it kills you. I'm going to repeat that. He's out to kill it before it kills you. You want God to kill your pride. You want to walk in humility. You don't want to operate in any shred of defiance or rebelliousness. Because I'm gonna tell you right now, God is setting something into motion. He's already set into motion. And we're gonna see what the scriptures tell us. It says, pride leads to disgrace, but with humility, everybody say humility, comes wisdom. It says, pride goes before, everyone say destruction. And haughtiness or arrogance before a fall. Pride before someone is destroyed, before everything goes wrong, 
The Bible says pride was there first. Pride caused something to happen. Arrogance and rejecting all forms of humility caused the fall. And this is something that is plaguing humanity and especially the people of God. Whether it be Old Testament, New Testament, it doesn't even matter. It says there is a path. Everybody say a path. Before each person that seems right, but the end is death. Everybody say death. Death is a lot closer when you embrace pride in your life. We say, I want it this way, and I'm going to do it my way for my family and my heart. God is saying, watch out. There's a way that you think is right. You think it's worked out before. God is saying, no, no, no. Death is right there. Death is right around the corner. So we have to be extremely careful on the decisions we make and the ways we do things. Because inherently, something's not correct. Pride will destroy you. Pride is the thing that God detests. His word says it. In the Old Testament, it speaks about Jeremiah and specifically the prophets, the Mosaic Covenant. I'm going to be all extra fancy on y'all. But Moses, Aaron, the tabernacle, the Levitical priesthood, basically the people of God at that time. Before Christ steps on the scene, tells them, hey, you guys got it all whack. I became the fulfillment of the law, right? And all that stuff. But we think that the Old Testament principles don't apply. They still apply. The intentions of how God operates still applies. The Bible says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Amen? Amen. So his word is still the same. We're in a better covenant right now. But God has not changed his attitude when it comes to pride when it comes to ego, when it comes to arrogance, when it comes to every part of corruption, God is not bending whatsoever to our man-made rules. He's king. He's Lord. He's master. And it's unfortunate that the children of Israel, Paul told the church, look back in the past. Look at the history of how God dealt with Israel, the Jewish people. And then you'll know he's still like that. He said he does not like idols before him. He doesn't like our stubbornness. He doesn't like our rebelliousness. It's witchcraft to him. It's manipulation. So when we deal with things, God is saying, I'm checking everything out. You can smile. You can shake hands. You can think, oh, yeah, I chose the leader here. I chose the pastor. I chose the church. They fit my agenda, my ways. When the reality is God sets this all up from heaven. He appoints. We're not like, there's no like registration. Oh, voter fraud, voter fraud. None of that. He's like, no, he's not taking counsel and saying, hey, angel number 3,020, whatever. 3 million and 26, whatever. L, whatever. Whatever their name is with an L on it. I don't know what their names are. Like Gabriel, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's like, He's not saying, hey, uh, we're going to choose Moses. We're going to, or who are we going to? No, he chose. Heaven sets it up. And you guys are going to find out very quickly 
God wants to make sure that you guys are not unaware of how this really works. There's still things that are tied in with how God deals with his people, even still till this day. And Jeremiah was dealing with something, the prophet. He was dealing with the fact that <laughs> they had stony hearts. They had hearts like, don't tell me what to do. We're going to figure this out. Pride. Arrogance. It corrupts the soul. And he starts speaking in regards to the sin of Judah. And this is what he says. And we're going to look at a few stories here to really paint the picture of how God really deals with pride, how he really deals with defiance. Because, you know, oftentimes, and I'm going to speak this in the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost just said, tell them David threw the rock at Goliath. But most of you guys see yourself as the hero. You see yourself as David when some of you guys are the brothers. Some of you guys were talking mess. Some of you guys were saying, no, I don't think he's fit. I don't think this is right. You could be honest. Some of us were murmuring, complaining when we shouldn't have. We should have appreciated who God has appointed and what God is doing through people's lives. Instead, we reject, we talk, we murmur. We try to bring down the people of God. We try to usurp the order and what God has established. And so Jeremiah makes it plain and clear now for them. And this is what he says to the tribe of Judah. He says, the sin of Judah is inscribed with an iron chisel engraved with diamond point on their stony hearts, meaning it, it is there. <laughs> it ain't getting removed. And on their corners of their altars. He said, even their children, everybody say children, children. go to worship at their pagan altars and Asherah poles. Asherah poles were literally these carved out trees. First thing, they're supposed to be worshiping God. Amen. But they're passing down generations of rebelliousness. And I can just tell you guys in the spirit, you don't want to be a family that starts passing down generations of rebelliousness. Because whether you know it or not, people are passing down their sins and these atrocities down from generation to generation. You see the preachers that go to these, <laughs> I've seen it on, the, on a YouTube, one of the guys that does content, I don't watch him all the time, but he said they go to the Dairy Queen, <laughs> y'all don't even know what I'm saying, Dairy Queen uh, uh, kids shows, all right, where you get these, you know, grown men dress up, looking like they work in the, the midnight hour, all right, got an outfit on like Tina Turner, or Beyonce, or whatever they think they are in that moment. Makeup all messed up, everything. Be like, you is not a woman whatsoever. But they walk in. Help me, Jesus. Probably ain't wearing no briefs, nothing. It's like, what is wrong? And then they're like, you know, trying to change their voice, everything. And the preacher comes up and says, you are abusing. This is child abuse. This is child abuse. It's demonic. And it's breeding rebellion. And it's, they're passing down sins upon sins. Doing it early because Satan knows that's how it works. Satan knows that if you pass it down early, they're going to get it. Most of the hardest. This be real. Most of the hardest times of our lives came when? When we were a child. When we were children. It was the most impressionable part of our lives. The bad stuff we remember. We remember what our parents passed down. Good, bad, and ugly. Amen? We remember what our cousins brought to us. Our family members. Slowly figure out, ooh, how did I learn? I remember the first time my sister taught me how to cuss. She, I was going to kindergarten. She was trying to help me out and 
She was like, you know, my mom was saying, she's like, hey, if people say this word, because y'all know what that word is, because I'm black. He said, y'all say the N I D D D. He said, you would cuss them out. And I was like, I, mama told me not to cuss. You cussed them out. That's how it was. She said, and you slap them. So I was already trained really early to literally be like straight demonic <laughs> out there. Not peace whatsoever. To cause trouble. To look for trouble. So we pass things down. And one of the worst things you could pass down is rebelliousness. Rebelliousness towards God. And even with Jeremiah, he's looking at the tribe of Judah. And he's saying, you're passing down something that is not right. Is not right before God. And here's the beautiful thing about it. He's saying their children go to worship at their pagan altars and Asherah poles beneath every green tree. It's almost like he's saying beneath the creators, our real creator that bless you guys with this land. Bless you guys with these opportunities. On every high hill, what was every high hill supposed to be? A place of worship. You remember when uh, Jesus spoke to the Samaritan lady and she said, my, my ancestors worship on this hill and they talk about that. It's like there's a reverence towards God, but he hates it when we operate from a state of rebelliousness. He doesn't tolerate it, y'all. It's not like he's like, mm. it's no peekaboo here. He says, so I will hand over my holy mountain along with your wealth and Pleasures or treasures. He says, and your pagan shrines as plunder to your enemies. He said, for sin runs rampant in your land. God does not like sin. He never liked it. He's eradicating it from the universe. So you are now going through a trial, literally an hour. This life is the only life you have. You're not going to literally like die, turn into, you know, a ball of corn. The corn gets eaten by a snail. The snail turns into a whatever, a squirrel. And then he's like, hey, I want my body back. We're not doing that. That's not what's happening here. You are going to have to deal with the, 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 the reality that if you embraced pride and rebelliousness, sins that God is like, I cannot stand that. It will not be in my kingdom. You're embracing the very thing. The first one to operate in pride was Satan himself, Lucifer himself. You're operating from the most egregious principle in the universe that God is saying, I have to quarantine this. And so he's telling them, sin runs rampant in your land. He said, the wonderful possession I have reserved for you will slip from your hands. Don't play with sin. All the promises, oh Lord, I want your promises. Okay, now live right. Do right. Get rid of pride. Better start renouncing all the foul stuff you've done. Get your heart right before me. Acknowledge your sins. That God does not want them in your life. And acknowledge the kind of sins that he's like, uh, 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 nope. You ain't hearing the kingdom of God on that. Let's keep looking at this here for a moment. He says, I will tell your enemies to take you as captives to a foreign land. And my anger blazes like a fire that will burn forever. This is God speaking, by the way. He says, this is what the Lord says. Cursed, everyone say cursed. cursed. Are those who put their trust in mere humans. What he's saying is you put your 100% trust in a human perception, a human way of thinking, human thought. It's the guy in office right now. It ain't the guy in office. Everybody's a puppet. What, what is y'all thinking? We have supernatural forces at work. That's why Jesus brought up and said there are spiritual thrones, dominions, powers in the unseen world that's really doing things. That's really pulling the strings. Why do you think Christ had to step on the scene? Get this thing right. And even Israel was supposed to be the only nation 
that can really show this is when God's hand is upon it. And you see how stiff necked and stubborn they were to the point where God said, OK, I got to get a people that are not even they don't even love me like that. He said, but I'm going to change their hearts and they're going to have stammering lips. They're going to move with my spirit. I'm going to change their heart of stone and put a heart of flesh in there. God was setting this up to reclaim humanity to the state that he wanted it to be. Not the foulness we see, but he still has to clean up sin in the camp. He can't ignore it. No matter how big, how small the group is, God deals with his church. He deals with his people. Old Testament, New Testament, eternity, he deals with his people. And however he deals with his people, that's what he wants. And so I'm believing that God is going to open up your eyes and your ears supernaturally to see. To see what he's really saying here. He's saying they rely on human strength and turn their hearts away from the Lord. He said they're like stunted shrubs in the desert. He said with no hope for the future, they will live in the barren wilderness. He said if you turn away from God, and some of us don't even know that we right on the edge with how we speak, how we think. You know, Jesus said it. He said, out of their lips, they praise me. But their hearts are what? Far from me. This is a heart check. This is a moment where you need to check, is there something inside of this thing? Robo saya. Something inside of this heart that God doesn't like. That God doesn't desire. What is it? He said, but blessed are those who trust. Everyone say trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope. You got to make God your hope. You got to make him your true confidence, which you hold on to. If you're holding on to the world, if you're holding on to the sins of your past, I'm telling you right now, you have not chosen the right, the right one. You've not made the right decision. God is saying, let it go, embrace me. Draw nigh to me, and I'll draw nigh to you. That's how this really works. But you got to trust him all the way, and you got to trust this system. You got to trust his people. You got to trust how he ordains, how he separates, how he appoints. Because oftentimes, whether it be the ecclesia, whether it be the older Old Testament nation of Israel, they always had a problem with who God elects. They always had a problem with who was really in charge, but not in charge. God designated them. And he did everything in their ability, and they still had issues. And I'm hoping that we don't miss out on what God can do through us. God is hoping that you catch whatever is going on in the inside that is not right before his sight. Get rid of it. Get it out. Give it to him. He said there are like trees planted along a riverbank, meaning in when you trust in God, you get nourishment, y'all. Your nourishment flows because why? It says their roots, everybody say roots, reach deep. Roots mean that you have the proper soil, the proper conditions. Your atmosphere has changed. I'm going to speak in the Holy Ghost. Some of you guys got to change that atmosphere. Now, you got to stop playing with God and change things up so that you can get rooted in the truth. You got to stop saying, God, is this all right? God's like, it ain't okay. Get out of it. Now start dedicating your time, your spaces to me. You're going to have to switch things up. There are some things that the Lord had me do years back. And he said, get up out of that apartment complex. 
I want you to go in a smaller space. This is this. You're paying too much to that. And I want you praying with me. And he started telling me even more things. And I fought, fought back. Da, da, da. Like, oh, okay. And I started growing closer and closer and closer to God when I obeyed his word. I really obeyed it. God worked in all these other areas of my life. I was in a, a nice little condo, really big too, like for the Bay Area, like a condo, 1,300 square feet, okay? Condo in the Bay Area. <laughs> like normally people live like somewhere between 400 to, you know, 700 square feet for like a one-bedroom condo. And I had that at age like 23, 22. Okay, so, and I was stealing cable. And as I got closer to the Lord, the Lord said, you're stealing cable. <laughs> I said, I'm not going to watch TV. He's like, okay, but you're still stealing cable. <laughs> you still got that little, little leaven in your box. You want to take advantage of stuff. Act like, oh, it ain't there. It ain't there. You put the blinders on. God is saying, take them blinders off. I'm trying to get you to see something. We got some blind spots in our lives. We got pride. We got ego. We got rebelliousness. We got a lot of stuff deep down. And God is saying, you need to get it out of you. You need to stop questioning how God does things. Start communicating. Start obeying. We always want understanding. What? Lord, tell me how this thing goes and then I'll move. God is saying, be obedient first. I don't need to explain anything to you. What makes you think that the God of the universe has to explain things to you? And he already sent his son and his word. But you go, God, talk to me. No, no, no. He wants to talk. But if he says something, obey it. If he says, get up out of the house. Stop doing those things. I had men of God come to me, literally, me and Sister May. We knew each other in the world. We were, we were boyfriend and girlfriend. Then I considered her for marriage, but she was staying over my house. And then finally, a man of God just told me straight up and said, you know you in sin, right? You shouldn't be doing that. And I was like, like we were just like eating some, I don't know, Taco Bell, something. It was just like, it happened so quick. And I was just like, man, he's super random. What's up? But then it stuck to me. It was like, wait a second. She shouldn't be in my house. She shouldn't be with us like that. But I never thought until he said something. Now, I could have been rebellious and be like, man, get up out of my house. Don't watch any of my free cable anymore. But God checked my heart. And he let me know the truth. And he said, this is how we got to change things. He said, you're going to live right before me. And you're not going to compromise my word. And so I said, God, I'm not going to be proud. I'm going to be humble because you oppose the proud. You give grace to the humble. To ones they say. So we made our adjustments. She rolled out. Went through three and a half months. Nothing. Did the right way. At least for three and a half months. And they got married. Not because our parents told us. Not because our friends said something. But truthfully, I had already been courting her for almost six months. And a voice kept telling me, don't do this. <laughs> like, don't even take this step. I knew what it was later. After I got freedom and deliverance and a lot of other stuff, it was a lot of soul ties, a lot of, of the enemy's lies. I remember one time we got so frustrated, I was planning for the wedding, and then we were like, let's just wait till everything happens. Let's wait till he arrives on the scene and everything, and we can have like two, uh, one and a half years. And I heard something say, if that happens, you guys will never be together. And I was just like, okay, yeah, no, no we're not playing. It was all God's timing because we acknowledged him in all of our ways. We didn't seek our kingdom. We seeked his kingdom first. Pride 
will cause destruction because you're thinking about your kingdom, not God's. You're not humbling yourself and saying, God, regulate my life now. Give me the guidance that I need in every aspect of my life. Not just one little corner of it and say, look, this is the part. And God is saying, no, the whole thing. So he's saying when you reach deep and you get the waters you need, you get the nourishment you need, then you become what? It says such a tree are not bothered by the heat. You don't get bothered by the persecution. You're secure in Christ. Amen. You're secure in your relationship. He says, oh, worry by long months of drought. Meaning in even though you're a tree planted by the waters, when you go through those seasons of difficulty, God is saying your tree will stand. And you will hold it together because your roots were deep, not shallow. He said the leaves stay green and they never stop producing. Everybody say producing fruit. He follows up and says the human heart. Everybody say the human heart. It says the most deceitful. Everybody say deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Everybody say wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? This is where the can of worms begin to open now. It says, but I, the Lord, search. Everyone say search. search. All hearts and examine secret motives. Everybody say secret motives. Okay. So God is the one that checks out. Even when we're yapping at the mouth, not knowing what we're saying, God is like, oh, see something there. That ain't right. So he starts to work through his system. Nothing. You can't hide anything from the Lord. You can think that you're doing it, but you're not. He's saying, I give all people their due rewards according to their actions. Everyone say actions deserve. That's what he's saying. Defiance against God will lead to destruction. And when we see these scriptures, we're going to see some of the most profound moments of rebelliousness and defiance within the children of Israel, within the body of Christ. And then you got to ask yourself, did I ever fit in any of these categories? Now, Moses you look at the book of Numbers, he starts talking about the gathering of Israel and how they're going to do things. This is like almost like a year after the, uh, the Exodus, all right? And he's setting them up in the wilderness and they're doing the tabernacle and they're doing all that stuff. There's a lot of stuff between Numbers 1 and 15 that's just some amazing stories, all right? You ever get an opportunity to read that stuff, it's going to really show you, you know, how God <laughs> really handles things. But there was a certain person out of the group named Korah. And he was the son of Ish Ishar, excuse me, Izar. He says, the son of Kohath. And these were the people, this tribe were a branch from the Levitical tribe. But they were, they were actually given responsibility. And it was detailed, y'all. So detailed that if you messed up, you most likely died. Okay? Like, it wasn't like, oh, man, I'm going to take a break. We're not going to grab our, we're not going to put this purple cloth over here. We're going to put a blue cloth today. God said, no, if I said blue, it's blue. I said red, it's red. I said purple, it's purple. They probably look at Magenta like, oh, don't even throw it in there. It's like, y'all messed up. Make sure. Make sure that's blue, that's red. Don't change it up. We like to change it up. We like to do like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, that's a pretty color. That's periwinkle. Holy Spirit, like, what in the world y'all doing? This is what I said. 
Y'all gonna read that stuff, and I'm telling you, if you got the attention span, you'll be like, whoa, wait a second. God was that serious about the tabernacle? He was that serious about the Ark of the Covenant? Yep. Very serious about his presence. Very serious about who he chose, how he chose it, who was placed. In fact, he said, I reserved the Levitical, uh, the sons, because of the firstborn that died in Egypt. He said, the day they died, I had already reserved the rest of these newborns. God is already taking stuff ahead of time in heaven while we trying to like add to it or subtract. You're going to see the relevance in a moment. I'm praying and believing that this God that we serve wants you guys to make sure you're on point. It says the son of Levi with Dathan and uh, I, I'm very I'm very hard with some words. <laughs> it looks like Abraham, but I know it's Ab Abiram. It says the sons of Eliab and on the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men. Basically, they conspired. Okay? They did a little chit-chat. Like, hey, hey, hey. We, we, let's, let's have our little private meeting. Let's not have a conversation. We're going to come together. Guys, I'm telling you, that is the most dangerous place to start. Pride starts to make things churn inside of a person. And they start making these little groups and these little co-conspirators. And say, hey, when we around Moses, y'all need to act like this. But then we separate it when we need to talk. Let's talk real with each other. Let's get this all straight. How you feel about how he's leading us? How you feel about how this is happening? How you feel about that? Look what happens. It says, and they rose up before Moses. They finally mustered the courage up. Or stupidity. They say, hey, you know what? We're going to do something different. He says, some of the children of Israel, 250 leaders of the congregation, representatives of the congregation, men of renown. It says, they gathered together, everybody say together, against Moses and Aaron, against who God actually called and elected and anointed. It says, you take too much upon yourselves. Look how they phrase that. <laughs> You're doing too much. You got so much going on. They said, for all the congregation is holy. Ooh, wait a second. Let God determine that, not you. We holy, just like Miriam. We hear God too. Slow your roll. You don't hear the same way. Don't get mad at God for his process and how he does it. We forget. It's like you're in this thing. You should be. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm here. <laughs> you could be like the dogs outside. You could be like the outsiders, literally. But you're here. But you're still not content. You're still not satisfied. Something ain't right. So they say, for all the congregation is holy, every one of them. And the Lord is among them, saying, we know God too. Why then do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? Uh-oh, big mistake. They thought that Moses and Aaron somehow self-appointed them. So they got there by their own little doing. They got there through, you know, whatever reason... Something entered their mind and said, you guys are not holier than us. We're just as holy as you. We're just as qualified as you. And we got plenty of people to do the stuff that you're doing. So what makes you so special? I'm paraphrasing. What makes you so special that you have authority over us? So when Moses heard it, he fell on his face. And even chapters earlier, he fell on his face with another group, if you guys know the context. Do you know what he fell on his face? When I saw that, I said, oh, Rabo Shanda, Romo Kwanab Aseya. It's the moment that a leader is in anguish. Because he's like, oh man, they tripping. Like for real? Like right now? Right now y'all doing this? Right now you have the audacity to come to the chosen man of God and say those things and brew up some 
conspiracy. And had the nerve, he fell on his face. He was like, oh, man, when you fall on your face, it's like. Like, what else? What else? There's more parallels to the Old Testament and the New Testament church than we even see. When you really start looking at things through the spirit, through how Jesus has set this thing into motion and how he's trying to get a gathering of people that really want to follow him and not question every little thing and not adopt conspiracies, literally. God don't want you to be a conspiracy theorist. God does not want you to be a conspirer. Do you understand that? God wants you to be someone that walks in obedience to his will, that doesn't embrace a heart of rebellion. He doesn't want you to embrace pride because he clearly says, I detest the proud. I give grace to only the humble. I reject every form of pride. It leads to destruction. There is a fall that comes when you operate in pride. And he says, and he spoke to Korah and all his company, all his little group. Tomorrow morning, the Lord will show who is his and who is holy and will cause him to come near to him. That one whom he chooses, everyone say chooses, he will cause to come near to him. It says, do this, take censers, Korah and all your company. It says, put fire in them and put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow. And it shall be that the man whom the Lord chooses, everybody say chooses, is the holy one, is the real set apart one. Okay? You take too much upon yourselves, you sons of Levi. He threw it right back at him. Okay? He said, then Moses said to Korah, hear now, you sons of Levi. It is, a, it is, it, it, is it a small thing to you that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel? He's basically saying, why are you acting like your position is like whack? <laughs> why are you acting like it's insignificant? Why are you acting like you being here is not actually important? Do you know how many times people go and do that over time? Like, don't have something in your spirit saying, oh, I could be doing that. I should be teaching. I should be preaching. Why is he always hogging the mic? Why is pastor doing this? Why is elder doing that? Why is the apostle doing these things? When you start doing that, I'm telling you, be careful. There's something deep down you need to go. Go to God, start renouncing things immediately. I'm telling you guys in the spirit of God. When you start saying things like that, why are we doing this? What's wrong with that? Why is everything changing up? This confusion. You're conspiring. Whether you know it or not. I'm just having discussion. No, you're conspiring. You got to have a heart that's ready to say, you know what? I really do believe. I know that this is how God works. And he appoints. And he anoints. And he separates. And I'm going to honor his ways and his, and his will. And I'm going to walk in humility, not in pride. And he tells them, he says, you're acting like your position is insignificant. He says, to bring you near to himself. To do the work of the tabernacle. He said, you got, you got a calling. You got a special ministry. You got a thing. Don't act like you don't have nothing. But you treat what you got like it's nothing. And then you get mad at the man of God for doing what he's supposed to do. You criticize. Conspire without even recognizing what it is. God is saying that's wrong. God is saying you got to stand before that. And he's saying the Lord, the tabernacle of the Lord, and to stand before the congregation to serve him. 
He says, and that he has brought you near to himself, you and all who are brethren, your brethren, the sons of Levi with you. And are you seeking the priesthood also? <laughs> he says, therefore, you and all your company are gathered together against the Lord. And what is Aaron that you complain against him? He's saying, you throw an Aaron in this thing. You got a problem with me. He said, but really, you think you got beef with me? You got beef with God. That's the truth. You think you're coming against the man of God? No, you're coming against God. Not saying that God is the man of God. His authority. Because he put that into motion. So God doesn't say, well, uh, the people, uh, the man. Uh, 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 uh. It's not like that. God is like, no, you're going to follow that. You're going to know that that is where he operates from. He doesn't do this like, huh? And you're going to see how this translates even into New Testament. He says, and Moses sent to call Dathan, Dathan, and Ab uh, Abraham. He says, the sons of Eliab, but they said, we will not come up. <laughs> Big mistake. He says, it is a small thing. That you, have been, that you have brought us up out of the land, flowing with milk and honey, to kill us in the wilderness. Bad perspective. Pride will distort how you see things. You won't see things correctly. You say, you brought me all the way out here to just die. You brought us out here. This, this thing ain't going forward the way it should be going. We should be doing this. We should be doing that. This is how we got to do it. This is how this ministry is going to be successful. This is what we should do right now. And he's saying that you should keep acting like a prince over us. God put something into motion here. He says, moreover, you have not brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey, nor given us an inheritance of fields and vineyards. Will you put out the eyes of these men? We will not come up. It says, then Moses was very angry and said to the Lord, do not respect their offerings. He says, I have not taken one donkey from them, nor I've hurt one of them. Okay, this is when accusation comes in. Be careful with that. We even know what elders, you got to have two or three witnesses to be doing stuff like that. So it says, and Moses said to Korah, tomorrow you and all your company be present before the Lord. You and they as well as Aaron. It says, let each take his censer and put his incense in it, and each of you bring his censer before the Lord. 250 censers, both you and Aaron, each with his censer. It says, so every man took his censer, put fire in it, laid incense on it, and stood at the door of the tabernacle of meeting with Moses and Aaron. It says, and Korah gathered all the congregation against them at the door of the tabernacle of the meeting. He says, then the glory of the Lord appeared to the congregation. He says, the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, separate yourselves from among this congregation that I may consume them in a moment. God was swift about his decision. He didn't say, oh, I'm choosing y'all over my call, over my appointed. Like literally they lost their mind. They get pulled out of Egypt, start complaining about leeks and onions we had it better when we was in Egypt. You look into the world because you don't know what you have. You're looking at your sin like it's something that, like, I really lost this thing. You should have lost it. It destroys you. It's going to kill you. The mindset, the thing that you still need it, is killing you. He said, they fell on their faces and said, Oh God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin? And you be angry with all the congregation. So the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the congregation saying, get away from the tents of Korah, Dathan, and uh, Abraham. It says, then Moses rose and went to Dathan and Abraham, and the elders of Israel followed them. It says, and he spoke to the congregation saying, depart now from the tents of these wicked men. Touch nothing of theirs, lest you be consumed in all their sins. He said, get away from that situation. 
He says, so they got away from around the tents of Korah, Dathan, Dathan, whatever, Abraham, the whole group. It says, came out and stood at the door of their tents with their wives, their sons, and the little children. Oh, man. And Moses said, by this you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these works. For I have not done them of my own will. Like basically, I didn't just pop up and say, hey, I want to be this. That's not how it works. God calls from heaven. We either follow or we don't follow. Usually when he calls, most of us follow and say yes. He said, if these men die naturally like all men, or if they are visited by the common fate of all men, then the Lord has not sent me. But, the, but if the Lord creates a new thing and opens and the earth opens its mouth and swallows them up, all that belongs to them, and they go down alive into the pit, then you will understand that these men have rejected the Lord. Everybody say rejected. rejected. Okay? It says, Now it came to pass as he finished speaking all these words, that the ground split apart under them immediately. It says, And the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up, and their households and all the men with Korah, with all their goods, took everything. It says, so they and all the house with them went down alive into the pit. He said, the earth closed over them and they perished from among the assembly. It says, then all Israel who were around them fled at their cry, for they said, lest the earth swallowed up us also. And a fire came out of this Lord and consumed the 250 men who were offering incense. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Tell Eleazar, it says, the son of Aaron, the priest, to pick up the censers out of the blaze, for they are holy and scatter the fire some distance away. He said, the censers of these men who sin against their own souls, let them be made into hammered plates as a covering for the altar, because they presented them before the Lord. Therefore, they are holy, and they shall be a sign to the children of Israel. So Eleazar, it says, uh, the priests took the bronze censers, which those who were burned up had presented, and they were hammered out as a covering on the altar. It says, to be a memorial to the children of Israel that no outsider who is not a descendant of Aaron should come near to offer incense before the Lord, that he might not become like Korah, and his companions. They said, we kept the sign to make sure you know that this is what really happened. He says, just as the Lord has said, through, uh, said to him through Moses. He says, on the next day, all the congregation of the children of Israel complained. Everybody say complained. <laughs> Help them, Lord. He says, against Moses and Aaron, saying, you have killed the people of the Lord. Now it happened. When the congregation had gathered against Moses and Aaron and they turned toward the tabernacle of meeting and suddenly the cloud covered it and the glory of the Lord appeared. Then Moses and Aaron came before the tabernacle meeting and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, get away from among this congregation that I may consume them in a moment. God ain't playing. God rolled up and said, oh, you guys, it, it, the beef is really with me. It's not with you guys. It's not with my appointed, you think is with them, you think is with the leaders, it's not. And they fell on their faces. So Moses said to Aaron, take a center and put it in the, in, look at this, put the fire in front, right, from the, from the altar, put incense on it and take it quickly to the congregation and make atonement for them. He says, for Wrath has gone out from the Lord. The plague has begun. Then Aaron took it as Moses commanded and ran into the midst of the assembly. And already the plague had begun among the people. So he put in the, sin, put in the incense and made atonement for the people. And he stood between the dead and the living. So the plague was stopped. Now those who died in the plague were 14,700. Oh my it says, besides those who died 
in the Korah incident. So Aaron returned to Moses at the door at the tabernacle meeting for the plague had stopped. I'm going to hold off for a moment and explain something. God hates rebelliousness in any form, in a conversation, in a heart posture, in an attitude. He hates it when he sees it in the body of Christ too. This is something that we have to recognize as a congregation to move forward according to his will, not our own. That this has nothing to do, every little ounce of division, everything that we start considering, saying, oh, well, I don't like about this, and I don't like about that. When we start having issues with each other, God is like, stop it. Get your heart right before me. If your life is really not your own, then you shouldn't be complaining about it. You should know that I have you. But does God really have you like that right now? We say it, but God knows what's going on in here. He knows the thoughts and the motives. They had a problem just like many people, even to this day, have a problem with the leadership. They have a problem with who has God appointed. As long as they say what I want them to say, we cool. But if they start saying stuff that really tackles and hits my family, hits my heart, has me start thinking about, man, I don't know about this place. Hey, well, you heard take this up with God ASAP. Take it up with the Lord. It's the same thing that happened with Samuel. He would speak to the people. And what happened? God's like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Giving you people to reach with y'all spiritually. Moses wasn't all up in their house saying, no, move this over here, move this over there. He wasn't in their life like that. He just said, hey, spiritual things, you know, this is what we got. This is how we create atonement. Do you see even how they ran off and basically said, look, we're going to try to preserve some of these people. We're going to try to make the effort. Now, I know Jesus is a high mediator and you can go to him. But the Lord has put leaders in place to set this thing into motion, to set other like God is like Jesus lifts off, hands over to the apostles. And this thing keeps going on. Most of us thought it just stopped. There's nowhere biblically says it stopped. That the way the church has developed and grown is like not really that way. That we just all just kind of just, no, that's not what he does. He said, I sent a preacher so that you can hear the word and your faith increase and you grow. That's what happens. And apostles break ground. They break ground and they build up and they find, okay, this is going on, that's going on, okay, this is amongst your crowd. And you can see with Paul, and we're going to see it just for a moment and close out. But with Samuel and the children of Israel, he basically tells them, hey, they're complaining again. What's new? <laughs> they're complaining and saying, I want a king. We good off this God stuff. <laughs> we want to see somebody. We want, we want a, a, a person. We want to see a face. Samuel was upset. He said, displeased that the request went to the Lord for guidance. <laughs> it's like, what? It's like, Holy Spirit, I don't really need that, but I need some other person. It says, do everything they do. He said, they say to do. He said, the Lord replied, for they're rejecting me, not you. They don't want me. They don't want me to be their king any longer. It happened in Jude. He told them, this is usually what happens. People come into the church and the congregation. They conspire. He said, they conspire and they say what? He said, ungodly people have warmed their way into your churches. Saying that God's marvelous grace allows us to live, everyone say, immoral, immoral. lives. God's grace does not permit you to live in a moral life. Wickedness will not be tolerated by the Lord. And here's the harder part. He puts it on the people of God and the family of God to handle this thing. He says condemnation of such people was re recorded a long time ago, meaning in God had already judged this thing. He saw it back then and we still see it now. 
Look what he says. They have denied our only master and Lord Jesus and Lord Jesus Christ. He says, so I want to remind you, he said that through, uh, though you already know these things, that Jesus first rescued the nation of Israel from Egypt. So Jesus was actually there like that. Amen. Not in the form we think, but he was always God. Amen. So it says, rescued the nation of Israel from Egypt. But later he destroyed those who did not, everyone say, remain faithful. Amen. God destroyed those that rebelled and were not fully trusting and committing to him. That's a problem. So he says, and I remind you, the angels. Now we even talk about the angels who did not stay within their first estate, their first limits of authority. He said, God gave them, but left the place. He says, God gave them, but left the place where they belonged. Even the angels rebelled. And what happened? He said, God kept them securely. This is their punishment. Chained in prisons of darkness. Okay, so then what about the demons? Because they ain't the same. <laughs> That's why. You're dealing with multiple levels of spiritual conflict right now. And God has put some in chains because they wreck everything up here. So he put them down below. And he's saying they're in prisons of darkness right as we speak, waiting for the great day of judgment. Don't forget about Sodom and Gomorrah. And he goes on. And he talks about all the immorality. And then he says they claim authority from their dreams, live immoral lives, defy authority, scoff at supernatural beings. If you ever did any of this in your life, you need to repent of that. You need to renounce it and make sure you're right with God. If you scoffed at authority, scoffed at people of God, you had issues with supernatural beings, ah, whatever, the devil, whatever. These things, I ain't worried about all that. You live in a crazy immoral life, still rolling up in here, something ain't right. Something ain't right. God said it in his word. Y'all can fact check me. I believe it's either in Timothy or Titus. But he says, he says, some sins are very obvious, but there are other sins that are hidden that won't be revealed until that day of Christ's return. And he said, there's some good things that are obvious, and there are some things we did good in secret that will be revealed in as well. So he commands and says, why don't you guys do the good all the time? Make the effort to do that. Instead of let your secret life be the good things you're doing unto God, not the bad stuff. Cut the bad stuff out. And he speaks about Michael and so forth. And you see the last part says, and like Korah, they perish in their rebellion. Every form of rebellion against God always led to destruction. And it was motivated by pride, by arrogance. That corrupts the soul. And most of it comes from people thinking that the man of God or the leadership should please the people. We have been taught incorrectly. The man of God has to beg you. Has to, oh, sister, oh, brother, oh, I got to, oh, oh. Because it's a system that they're doing. Get them here, get the money, get them out. We grow in a whole, no, cut it out, man. What's really happening? Then got the nerve to criticize all the stuff that we be doing. <laughs> when, the, when the ecclesia really be stepping up. And we take little parts of it out, say, no, we ain't going to do the tongues. We ain't going to do that. No prophecy. We, we going to, no holiness for sure. We ain't going to put holiness in the church. That doesn't belong. We could just act nuts. Just come in. Why do you think most of the time we walk up in here and it's got to look like a club? What do you think the sensory, like the, the output that what they're trying to tell is let this thing look like a club. Then you can be like and it's really because you probably need deliverance. You probably need some deliverance in your life. You need some transformation and renewal of mind. Because you are not thinking anymore about God's word. You're thinking about yourself. 
Now he says, I wasn't appointed by any group of people or any human authority, but by Jesus himself and by God the Father who raised Jesus from the dead. That's what happened with Paul. And this is one thing another man of God shared with me. Heaven appoints and anoints. Men of God confirm. In Acts, the prophets and the teachers gathered around Apostle Paul, who wrote this letter, as well as Barnabas, and they laid hands on them. They confirmed what heaven already established. That's what really happens. And God uses people to do that. And he's saying, obviously, I'm not trying to win the approval of people, but, but if pleasing people were my goal, it would not be Christ, I would not be Christ's servant. Basically, a man of God cannot please the people. He has to please God. So he has to say the things that God is saying. He says, we speak as messengers approved by God. Entrusted with the good news. Our purpose is to please God. Everybody say, please God. please God. Not people. He says, he alone examines the motives of our hearts. Haven't you heard this before? Jeremiah. <laughs> this is Thessalonians. This is way now the church age. Another scripture says, as bond servants, obey in all the things your master according to the flesh. Not with eye service or men pleasers. Don't just say it. And not really mean it. That's why I asked you guys. If you guys really understand who I am to you, you guys will be going to God, pleading with Jesus. Help this man of God. Help me to become what I am. I know he's here, not by accident. I should not be questioning and talking on the side of my mouth about decision making. Whatever's being said, I should be praying for the man of God. You shouldn't be co-conspiring. You shouldn't have these moments where you're thinking a certain way. You're not really reverencing God in this process and what he's doing in your life right now. He says, try to please them all the time. He says, just when they are watching you. He says, as slaves of Christ, do the will of God with all your heart. And this is the same thing he speaks to overseers in the book of Acts. And Paul says, look, shepherds, overseers of the church of God. He said, God has made you that. The Holy Spirit made you that. And he said, I know that eventually when I bounce, when I leave, savage wolves will come among you, not sparing the flock. I told you guys again, I'm here to look for wolves. <laughs> here to raise y'all up, but if any wolves pop up, I'm slicing their head off. In Jesus' name. And I mean that. And God will back me up. And I've seen wolves pop up and I've seen them destroyed. Literally. I've seen Korahs. I've seen them pop up. And God has taken them out. I've seen it happen. I almost became one. <laughs> and God spared my life. Kept me from dying on that car crash. It told me, slow down. You see, get your right... Get your act right. He said, like, he said, I'm in control. I said, ooh, I, I understand. And I was in the snow. He said, no, nah, I didn't give you a spirit of fear. Turn this thing on and drive off. And I was in a heated argument with my bishop. Like, the, the, the arrogance was so thick, I know heaven was like, ooh, wait a second. Hold on. He even forgot. I don't, I don't, I'm not down with pride. I don't care how much you've done in this ministry. I don't care how much you sacrificed. You don't do that. And I repented to the Lord and I got right and I realized, man, I almost lost my life because of arrogance. I, couldn't, I would have never seen how any of this happened. One moment of arrogance, one moment of pride consumed me. And the Lord had mercy right on the edge. I should have died in that snow. And after that, I checked everything. My own bishop had to tell me later. He said, yeah, we saw it at the last meeting. He said, I can see it in your eyes. I can see it in your heart. He said, we were trying to talk to you. He said, you kept pushing everybody away. So God gave me an opportunity to get right. To not be a Korah in the land. Because he wouldn't tolerate it. No matter how much. Korah was doing everything Moses said. He was, okay, I, okay, pastor. Okay, we'll do this. But inside they're grumbling. Oh, hate him. Can't stand this. 
I should be doing this. I should be doing that. This should be here. This is how it should be going. We make mistakes. We're not doing it right. Let's band together. God's saying, kill that now. For I have to kill it. It will consume you. It almost consumed me. God really does set up his men of authority. It's his authority. It's not mine. His authority. His way. It's really for your good, not for your destruction. When it says wolves, it says among yourselves will rise up men speaking perverse things, draw away the disciples after themselves. And he says, therefore, watch. Everybody say watch. watch. OK. Now he tells them to go on and get built up. And this is one of the hardest ones to follow. As Paul tells them about the church. He basically tells them, look, I can't believe you guys are tolerating this type of sin in your congregation. I can't believe you guys are still putting up with this stuff. That's like everybody up in here. I hear something about somebody doing something and I go to the Lord like, what is going on? I could be real. If somebody was like, oh, yeah, uh, they like, oh, I, I don't. Yeah, they don't really be tithing or they be giving. And then they'd be like, you know, oh, we saw so-and-so at the club. Like, what? Every club costs money. You don't just walk in, you don't just sneak it in. We're going to act like you a bouncer? Just roll in? I'm bouncing people for Jesus. No, you wasn't. And this is what he's saying. He's saying, you guys are acting like basically the world. People sleeping around, he says, you're so proud of yourselves. You think everything's going cool. And he says, you should remove this man from your fellowship. Some would say, oh, Paul, that's harsh. Man of God, that's harsh. That's how they did it. God didn't open up. I mean, Ananias and Sapphira had the heart stop. Korah had the ground open up. And now he tells us, as preachers, as pastors, as shepherds, as apostles, hey, if this don't work out right in a congregation, remove them. Get them out of here. That has to be known. If pride comes over a person and says, I refuse to get out of my sin, I don't want to change. And God is saying, nope. In the spirit, he's saying, I already checked in with God. He said, already have made my what? Past judgment on this man. He already knew what to do. He said, in the name of the Lord Jesus, I must call a meeting of the church. The church has to be acknowledged. They met up like a Levitical priesthood the whole nine. They, they went before God. God made the decision. Say, you go over there. You go over there. I'm going to kill him. That's my decision. Not, oh, Lord, please spare us. There was no please spare us. You messed up the moment you... You jacked up when you looked at the man of God and said, this is what it is. It's not really that. Stop creating illusions in your mind because you see something else happening. You got people out there right now, pastors and, uh, and elders, that are not really even operating in the qualifications. He said, I will be present with you in spirit. He said, you must throw this man out. Did he give him an option? No. He said, hand him over to Satan. So that his sinful nature will be destroyed. So God ain't just wrapping everybody up. He's like, okay, I'm going to use the Satan and let him do the work on the flesh. He said, but he says he himself will be saved on the day of the Lord returns. But here's the thing. Why he has to do that? He says this boasting that is terrible. Don't you realize that sin, everybody say sin is like a little yeast that spreads through the whole batch of dough. Once it's there, it infects everything. That's why God is like, I got to get rid of the chorus. I got to get rid of the conspirators. I got to get rid of the wolves. I got to get rid of all the folks that say, hey, I got something going on. I'm going to change things up in here. I'm just waiting my time. I'm baiting my time. That's why I told you guys in the Holy Ghost, amen for that. <laughs> he said, he probably won spelling bees and everything. <laughs> Help me, Jesus. 
And this is what the Spirit of God is showing us today. If we tolerate sin in this congregation, then this will affect the entire batch of dough. If we tolerate pride, arrogance, rebelliousness, it will consume you. It will destroy you. God has to deal with it. God must resist it. And then here's the thing. It's almost like, thank you, Holy Spirit. This is good. When I was a manager at the men's warehouse, specifically in San Mateo, and you know, they practically hated my guts <laughs> as soon as I showed up there. But one of the things that happened was you got a young couple flirting, doing all this stuff. And then eventually I started to see behaviors that I was like, nah, that don't seem right. That looks like sexual harassment. And I started to give them a bunch of warnings. And it got to a point where I had to tell my other manager, we talked and we said, hey, man, we got to correct this now. This is like super inappropriate. I said, and he's 19, she's 17. I know she's about to turn 18, but still, she's a minor. And it was a split second, and I was like, you know what? I really don't want to embarrass this dude. She almost seems like she's kind of like, you know, giving into things, likes the attention, all that. So I tried to play it cool like that first. Then we talked again, and he said, yeah, man, we need to do something now. I don't care how he's acting, yada, yada, yada. If we don't do something, then our heads are on the chopping block. And see, this is the thing. You guys need to understand something. If I don't deal with this the way that God wants me to deal with this thing, then I'm put in subject. Now God is saying, hey, you're not listening. You got a problem with me. Y'all think that's not how it works. It works like that. Even Paul said, I'm running the race so that I may not be disqualified. I'm trying to run this thing and get and pass. I'm not doing it just because, oh, out of emotion. He's like, I love you guys. I'm enduring this thing to live as Christ, to die as gain. He said, I'd rather just be gone with God. But I'm suffering so that you can get something out of this. So that you can live the life that God wanted you to live. Don't act like that I'm a burden, because I'm not. And that's why he's saying what he's saying today. He said, get rid of the old yeast by removing the wicked person from among you. Then you will be like a fresh batch of dough made without yeast. That's a hard decision to make. It says, which is what you really are. Christ our Passover lamb has been sacrificed for us. He says, so let us celebrate the festival not with old bread of wickedness and evil, but of new bread. Everybody say new bread. New bread. Of sincerity and truth. You got to operate from sincerity and truth. Humility, not pride, not arrogance. He said, I told you not to associate with people who indulge in these sins. And he said, I wasn't talking about outsiders. I wasn't talking about unbelievers. He was always talking about the house of God. He said, if you indulge in these sins, he said, you need to avoid them. He said, but I meant to not associate with anyone who claims to be a believer. If you are claiming to be a believer in Christ, hear me out clearly, crystal. And you are going in habitual, continual, willful sin. Then the house of God has to judge. The ecclesia, the church, has to say, what is going on? There has to be discipline. Nothing can be ignored. It's not like the way y'all think it, the way we think it. True biblical, scriptural discipline of sin, specifically rebelliousness, pride, and these sins that are contrary to God, these are the sins listed out. He said, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. That is the end result. He's saying sexual sin, greedy, worships idols, abusive, drunkard, cheats people. God is saying, don't fit in those categories. If you are, repent, renounce. Get delivered, get healed, get transformed. It shouldn't be your identity. 
He said, don't even eat with them. Wait a second, we ain't even supposed to have a sandwich? He's like, no. This is where it gets tough. Because he's saying if they're claiming one thing, I'm not talking about trying to reach somebody. I'm talking about once you realize and you're in it and you get the truth and you're like, wait a second. God doesn't want me still wrapped up in my sin. No, he never did. He never did. To me, I look at it and I go, why even mention this if, if most of the people that show up don't think it's possible? God's saying, because this is my word. Because it is possible. Because you can live holy. You can live set apart. You can walk in freedom. You can overcome. Because Christ overcame. And he was sharing with us and trying to tell us that this is possible. But you got to get whatever's right or whatever's wrong inside, God wants to make right. But God wants to pull out. He says, my, not my responsibility to judge outsiders, but it's your responsibility. Everybody say responsibility, responsibility. to judge. It's real. It's in there. You say, don't judge me. Look, sorry, man. Y'all don't know what y'all talking about. Christ said judge and righteousness. That's what he said. He said the spirit, man, the one in the spirit can evaluate all things. He said those inside the church who are sinning. God is saying, get the help you need. He said, God will judge those on the outside. As the scriptures say, you must remove the evil person from among you. And this is what's happening in the last times. People are living for themselves. They're only thinking about their money. They're, bro they're boastful. They're proud. They're scoffing at God. They're disobedient to their parents. They're ungrateful. They don't make anything sacred. And God is saying they're unloving, they're unforgiving, they slander others, they have no self-control, they're cruel and they hate what is good. They betray their friends, they're reckless, they're puffed up, they have pride. Everybody say pride. pride. They love pleasure rather than God. If you love pleasure, then loving God, that is an issue. That's where God is working on now. And God is speaking to us and telling us, stop acting religious. He said they reject the power that can make them godly. Stay away from people like that. He said they work into people's homes and get them to do certain sins. And he said they basically are like these women. He said they forever follow a new teaching. You're trying to hear something new, something new. And you never embrace the first truth that you got. And Paul says this again. He says, I'm urging you in the presence of God, who's going to judge the living and the dead. He's going to set his kingdom up. He says, you need to preach the word, be prepared in difficult times or even great times. Patiently correct, meaning in an elder is supposed to correct rebuke with good teaching. He says, people will no longer listen to wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and look for teachers to tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They reject the truth and chase myths. He said, keep a clear mind in all these situations. And so now he's saying this here. Thank you, Lord. Now he tells them to submit to authority. And he's telling them primarily now that they cannot slander or keep fighting one another and they have to show true humility. Everyone say true humility. That is the truth and what God wants to replace. All the arrogance, all the pride, all the stuff that you don't even know is going on in the inside. God wants to exchange that out for true humility. He's saying, I understand you're foolish. You shouldn't be a slave to your lust and pleasure. All right. He said, you should not be operating a lives full of evil. And nobody in here in the ecclesia should ever hate each other. Well, you know what I hate? I hate the sin. I don't hate anybody here. I love every single person in here and even future, past, present. It don't matter. I love y'all in Jesus' name. I hate the sin. I hate the corruption in your lives. I hate the pride. I hate the arrogance. I hate the things that you don't see. God hates it too, even more. So when he tells me, tell them this now so that their souls be right. So that their attitudes be adjusted. So that they can start walking in truth. 
He said he saved us not because of the righteous thing we did. He said because of his mercy. Wash away our sins. You've got to know what he did. Give you a new birth. And you have a new life through the Holy Spirit. And now God is putting this thing in together so we can inherit eternal life. But this is the thing he leaves. He says, trust these teachings and trust in God and devote. He said, devote yourself to doing good. Because this is beneficial for everybody. And look what he says. All the other stuff we fight about, summing it up, useless and a waste of time. He said, if people are causing divisions, everybody say divisions. divisions. Among you, he says, give a first and second warning. God gives warning. He says, after that, have nothing more to do with them. This is the thing we need to understand as the ecclesia. Because if something like that permits, everybody else gets affected. So you have to check your heart today. Check your mind and say, you know what? If I had some issues, Lord, with how things were going on in this group, in this ecclesia, Lord, forgive me. I repent. I renounce it now. I'm going to get this right. If I have pride, if I have arrogance, I have whatever it is, it's time for you to say, God, I messed up. I'm going to get right. I don't want to be on the bad side. I want to be humble. I want you to exalt me in due time. I don't want to operate in resistance because here's the thing. He never fails. We just say he never fails. Yeah, he never fails. He won't fail in resisting either. He says, people have turned away from the truth and their own sins condemn them. Now, this is what I'm going to ask everybody to do. Let's stand. And I'm going to speak this over your guys' life. God wanted to make sure, no matter how much we suffer in, I know we're not in Zimbabwe or something right now. Even though it feels like we're probably in Maui. <laughs> with no AC. But I'm going to tell you right now, we are here to help people get out of the place that's hotter than ever, and that's the lake of fire. You're here because God has called you, and if you really believe you're chosen, you need to walk in the truth. Get your heart right before God. Get your heart right before God. Get your mind right. Start acknowledging if there was anything that you know. God don't say that unless something actually happened. I ain't imagining things. Do you understand? I know the Holy Ghost speaks. But you need to know that He's watching. That He's speaking. That He's letting you know. Today is the day where you can repent. You can have a change of mind. You can say, God, change my heart. Check in anything that's not right. So I can get right before you. So you can serve him the way he wants you to serve. That you're saying, God, I'm going to do this, but I'm going to do this in decency and in order. Why don't you have JJ come back? No, we're going to pray corporately. Thank you, Lord. Now, if you know there's something personally that you have been <laughs> saying some stuff or doing some things, it's time to get right about it. You know the opportunities are here. But God wants you to know it's stark. He's not going to tolerate sin in our lives. He wants us to not tolerate rebelliousness or anything that will cause division within his group, within his family. Do we all understand that? Amen. Amen. It's not saying that he doesn't love you. He actually loves you more because he gives us warning. He gives us a heads up. So this is what i like us to do right now. I want you guys just have a moment. Just lift your hands up. Bow your heads to the Lord. God is going to work on you right now. I want you guys to all repeat after me. Say, Father... Please forgive me of my heart, my mind, my soul. Lord, let it be right before you. 
I renounce all pride, arrogance, ego, and the sins in my life. I don't want them. I just want you. Jesus, move right now. Remove every unclean spirit in my body. Jesus, you're my healer, my redeemer. I love your order. I want to be holy. Make me new right now. Cleanse my heart. Pour in your spirit. Show me your ways. Show me how to love my brother and my sister. Jesus, I hate sin. I hate the sin in my life. I don't want it anymore. Jesus, I ask for wisdom. How to live right before you. To follow your ways and not my own. I renounce rebelliousness, stubbornness, anger, depression, lies, and anxiety in my life right now. Holy Spirit, set me free. Bring holiness and order to my family, to my marriage, to my household right now. In Jesus' name. Bring this holiness and love to this family, to this congregation. Remove the sin and the wickedness out of our group right now. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Hallelujah, Jesus. Father, I thank you right now for the people of God. I cover every single person in the mighty name of Jesus that they can walk in truth. Lord, I believe, Lord Jesus, that they're all going to get right before this and not tolerate any more. Lord, the warning was sent out, Lord. You don't tolerate sin. You don't tolerate rebelliousness. And if there's a whiff of it here, Lord, you will correct it. You will adjust it. And I just ask, Lord Jesus, that we destroy every form of division in this place, that we work together, that we work our problems, and we look for solutions. You are the solution, Lord. So I just pray primarily, Lord Jesus, for the covering of your grace and your mercy. Lord, protect these people as they leave with their families. I pray right now in the mighty name of Jesus that your supernatural love and your power, Lord Jesus, and your favor, Lord, be with them as they continue to serve Christ. Open up their eyes. Chastise them. Discipline us, Lord, so that we can really move in your glory. We can really move in your presence. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. Lord bless you guys. Um, I'm going to tell you guys, if you feel like you're going through something and you need to text, you need to send me an email, do that. I'm always praying for you guys. But I need you guys to know that we are at a turning point and we cannot be a helter-skelter, flying off the seat of our pants type church, okay? Amen. Even though we're small, we have great responsibility here, okay? There's a lot of power in this place when we really focus, okay? So get rid of the distractions and the things that are causing torment in your life. Amen? Amen. All right, let's work together in Jesus' name. Blessings to you guys.